Welcome. Welcome all to our Sunday worship here at Holy Sepulchre, although wherever we are, we are gathering in, uh, in God's name and he will be with us where we are. So it is good to gather. It is good to gather, um, particularly on this uh, fourth Sunday in Advent as we continue to, to journey as we can continue to prepare and allow ourselves to be open to be transformed, I pray. So as we gather, let us start with a prayer. Loving God, you know each of us by name. You love each of us exactly as we are. So as we come together today, individually and as a community, Help us to know you better. Help us to, to grow closer to you. Help us to journey with you. Let us do all that we can to recognize our role in your mission and be encouraged in that. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Let us start with some worship. Thank you, Emma. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails. 
cause it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. constancy, Lord, and that you don't change. And we worship you now. Shout. 
Emma, thank you. Thank you. Just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful worship. Help you. Thank you for sharing your amazing gifts. Let us have a continued time of uh, prayer for ourselves and others. And I just wanted to start with a special prayer for today. God, our Redeemer, who prepared the Blessed Virgin Mary to be the mother of your son, grant that as she looked for his coming as our savior, so we may be ready to greet him when he comes again as our judge, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. So let us pray. And as we think about that coming, remember that he came, that he died for us, and so that we would be forgiven. Let us consider our role in the world today, the things that we've said and done and things that we haven't said and haven't done. But remember, we have a loving God who runs to us with open arms, that our sins are forgiven, that he loves us exactly as we are, knowing that we stumble and fall. So let none of us carry that burden of sin because he lifts it off. He lifts it off each of us. He loves each of us. Is with each of us. So let God, we pray for all those who don't yet know you, that don't know the love that comes from a relationship with you, don't know the forgiveness that comes from a relationship with you. Don't know the care and compassion and strength that comes from that relationship. They don't know the hope and certainty that comes from that relationship with you. At a time when the pandemic is bringing more and more uncertainty again to people's lives, Lord, We pray for all those involved in the decisions around 
health, decisions around communities, those involved in the healthcare profession, those involved in arranging vaccines. We pray for all those who are caring for others who are sick, who are worried about loved ones. We live in a society where we want all to know and have choices. Encourage all, though, Lord, to make choices that are not just about ourselves, but about all people. Help us to consider our neighbours in all our decisions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we also pray for all those who are unwell for other reasons also, for all those who are caring for them. It must seem at times, Lord, for those with other illnesses that they are put aside and forgotten when so much is prioritised around the pandemic. Hospital appointments are cancelled. And so for many, this is a deeply worrying time as they wait for other operations. We pray for the peace that they need, the hope that they need. He also prays for those who've lost loved ones at this time or for those who this is a time when memories of lost loved ones are brought to the front of mind when settings at tables are thought about those that are missing are thought about We know, Lord, that for many, it's good news that you bring. It's not always good news to all for their context. Help your disciples, Lord, to be alongside those who are hurting. Help them to know the true good news that you offer to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we pray for all in our churches, in leadership roles, in lay roles, as well as clergy, all those who are active in serving in whatever way. We praise Praise and thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that you give, but also for each of them for accepting that call. For the joy that, is bringing, that it is bringing to many people at this time. The community that it brings to many people at this time. Help those continued decisions that they need to make about opening up, looking forward to the new year as to the priorities that need to be set. We particularly pray for our community here as we look to 2022 as to our mission and our priorities, how we serve our community as a parish church, a city church, a national musicians church. Help us to know your will. 
those in our team and our PCC and all those involved. To know your will and to be encouraged as we serve you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us each bring to God now those particular concerns on our hearts, either silently or if others want to speak their prayers, please do. We'll take a few moments. Until merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, our Lord. And hopefully uh, Rachel can uh, put up the uh, Lord's Prayer. And if you'd like to unmute, we can say that together. Our Father, Father in, in, heaven, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be your, your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come. Your, your will, will be done, done. On, on earth, earth as, as in heaven. heaven. Give us Give today, today our daily, our daily bread. bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins, sins as we as forgive, forgive those who sin against us. us. Lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver, but deliver us from evil. For, for the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and, and the glory are yours, yours now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Don't know whether we. I think, Tessa, do we have a a, a reading? Is it? I don't know whether it's on the slides. Uh, we do. Yeah, it should be on the slides. Do you want me to read, or did somebody else? Would Would somebody like to read, or would you like me to do that, Tessa? Be great if you would. That'd be lovely. Sure. No worries at all. The ruler from Bethlehem. But you, O oh Bethlehem of Ephrathah. Who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall live secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. Luke 1. In those days Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour, for he has looked with favour on the lowliness of his servant. 
Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abram and his descendants forever. Thanks, Nick. Well, welcome everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen at various points as well. So um, if anything doesn't quite work, then give me a shout, but hopefully it'll all be fine. <laughs> um, I'm just going to just pray briefly before I begin. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus name. Amen. So I watched recently Back to the Future for the first time. I know, I know, there's no excuse for not having watched it. It's on every Christmas. Frankly, I've been alive too long to not have seen it. Anyway, the reason for watching it just recently was that I was invited by a couple of lovely friends from church uh, to the musical version a few weeks ago. So I felt like it was only sensible to watch the original movie first so that it made sense to me. So there they are. <laughs> um, in case you too are a novice in the ways of Marty McFly and Doc Brown, the basic premise is that 1985 teenager Marty ends up traveling back in time with no means to return to his own time to 1955 when his parents were high school acquaintances. Just by meeting his parents, Marty disrupts the course of his own family family history and his mission with the help of his friend Doc becomes not just to return to his own time but also to ensure that the events which led to his own birth are restored assuring him of his own continued existence. Another great sci-fi from that era one of my personal favorites TV show Quantum Leap sees physicist Sam Beckett leaping backwards and forwards through time, finding himself inhabiting the bodies of various people throughout history and living their lives for a time for the purpose of alleviating some suffering or other in the circumstances of the people he's living in. In both of these sci-fi scenarios, the characters are compelled to change or correct events of the past. Would it make a difference if one tried to disrupt historic events or were they destined to happen regardless of one's efforts? Does changing historic events change the whole course of history throughout the world or just in that particular person's life? These are just thought experiments. Time travel is something people love to theorise about. And, but no scientist has managed it so far, though Einstein did prove that travelling at light speed would make you age more slowly in case that's helpful to know. I think one of the things which fascinates people about time travel is the idea that we might be able to change things, to alter major decisions, prevent wars, remove obstacles, generally play God in all sorts of ways. But of course, the only one who can actually play God is God. We humans are totally time bound, constrained to this very steady linear progression of seconds, minutes, hours, days. Time can seem to speed up or slow down, of course. Think of lockdown last year. So many people experienced days in a kind of slow motion. And yet, over the course of months, time seemed to be going at a crazy speed. How has it been almost two years? I have friends I haven't seen in that time, even though it only feels like a few months since I saw them. <laughs> I wonder perhaps the notion of long-term friendship is actually quite helpful in thinking about time. 
I've known my oldest friend, Helen, since we were nine, playing together in cello groups and orchestras, sword fighting with our cello bows, <laughs> sharing the ups and downs of teen life, early adulthood, relationships, her wedding a few years ago and a new baby. With nearly 30 years of friendship under our belts, when I see Helen, it feels like no time has passed at all, even though so much may have happened since we last saw each other. We pick up exactly where we left off. There's no need for any kind of warming up or getting used to each other again. We're still completely tuned into our relationship as though no, no time has passed in 30 years. And as if each time we part is just a short break in a lifelong conversation. And relationship is exactly what we're given in the person of God. The God we call Father. The God who lives with and within us as the Holy Spirit. The God who is the human man, Jesus. God is relationship in God's very being and nature. So I wonder then, perhaps that's why for God, no time has passed, even when all time has passed. Because God's relationship within God's self makes time irrelevant and immaterial such is the bond of love within the Trinity. The Apostle Peter wrote, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. God isn't constrained by the passing of time. Theologian and Lutheran pastor Robert Jensen wrote, the eternity of God is his faithfulness. He is not eternal in that he secures himself from time, but in that he is faithful to his commitments within time. In other words, it's a complex book. I don't recommend it, but I can, I can lend it to you if you like. <laughs> In other words, God's eternity doesn't make him more removed from us time bound beings, but rather being eternal means he will fulfill the promises he's made to us. God is not constrained by time's linear progression or by its pace, whether or not we consider it too slow or too fast. And yet how often do we find ourselves frustrated by time in some way? Who among us has prayed for the end of this pandemic to be today, preferably a year ago? Who's willed a meeting to be finished quickly, please? Or who has worried that a child is growing up too fast? Or that you'll never get everything done that you have to do and you just need time to slow down? Time seems rarely to be our ally in life and having your expectations or hopes of time thwarted is hard to take. Let me show you a relatable scene. Set in a world where different kinds of animals live together in harmony, all wear clothes and all speak English. <laughs> it's Disney's Zootopia. I'll make sure I'm sharing sound as well for you. Flash is the fastest guy in there. You need something done, he's on it. I hope so. We are really fighting the clock and every minute counts. Wait. They're all sloths? Are you saying that because he's a sloth, he can't be fast? I thought in Zootopia, anyone could be anything. Flash, flash, 100-yard dash. Buddy, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Hey, Flash, I'd love you to meet my friend. Uh, darling, I've forgotten your name. Hmm. Officer Judy Hap, CPD, how are you? I am doing just fine as well as i can be hmm. what hang in there can i do well i was hoping you could run a play for you well i was hoping you could today 
Well, I was hoping you could run up late for us. We are in a really big hurry. Sure. What's the plate? Two nine T number. Two nine T H D zero three. Two nine. THD03. T. HD03. H. D03. D. Mm -hmm. Zero three. Zero. Three. Hey, Flash, want to hear a joke? No! Sure. Mm. Okay. What do you call a three humped camel? I don't know what do you call a three-humped camel? Three-humped camel. Pregnant. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> Yes, uh, very funny, very funny. Honestly, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that and it still makes me laugh. <laughs> I love <laughs> I love he's called I love the fact he's called Flash. I also love, I don't know if you've noticed, the mug on his desk which just says on it, you want it when? It's oh it's lovely. I I recommend the movie, it's great. <laughs> We have here two very different expectations of time, hilarious in their incompatibility. For a god who is eternal but also acts within time, any notion of acting quickly or slowly is perhaps irrelevant because god acts when god chooses. And that choice is both for a specific moment and for always. Micah shared his prophecies between 750 and 686 BC, reminding Israel of God's covenantal promises and of the restoration that was to come for them. In the passage we've just heard, Micah is seeing ahead to a time when an unexpected individual from an, ind from an insignificant place will lead God's people into salvation and peace. I think it's quite easy to forget that this passage is an actual prophecy, not just ancient poetry. There are various Old Testament passages that are so well known, especially that we hear around this time at Christmas, Advent and Christmas, that many of us could almost recite by heart without actually truly considering their significance. But to think that these messages of hope were spoken hundreds of years prior to that hope being fulfilled, and that the eternal, timeless God was speaking in that ancient time to a specific person about a specific future event, which would then have an impact on each of us thousands of years later. Prophecies are themselves a way in which we see God work, both within time, through the words and actions of a specific person in history, and outside of it, through God's knowledge, of what's to come in the future. Who knows how Micah viewed the words from God which he spoke to his community or what he envisaged as their fulfillment. But I've no doubt that he trusted that God was faithful to his commitments within time. These weren't idealistic notions, a wish list of best case scenarios, but the faithful promises of a God who acts in time for all time. And so we come to the passage where, from Luke, where, pregnant with the promises which Micah proclaimed, Mary greets her cousin Elizabeth. And in this moment, the unborn John the Baptist, who in his lifetime prepared the way for Jesus, was proclaiming the joy of Christ before he'd ever even seen the light of day for the first time. Before he'd been born, John was responding to who Jesus was. And John wouldn't even live to see Jesus' death, let alone his resurrection or ascension. 
John never got to see the ultimate fulfillment of what God had revealed to him. But he, like Micah, trusted the one who called him. And he also knew the signs of God's kingdom because when he sent word from prison some years later, in both when both of their ministries were in flight, he sent word asking Jesus if he was the one they were waiting for. All Jesus needed to say was, the blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised and the poor have good news brought to them. This language of salvation and deliverance echoes Micah's message and indeed all God's prophets. But I've got ahead of the action a bit here. John hasn't even been born yet. <laughs> We've got Mary and Elizabeth in front of us rejoicing together for the gift God has graced each of them with. Elizabeth is experiencing the extraordinary timing of God, pregnant a long time after she expected it. And Mary too is experiencing the extraordinary timing of God, but instead pregnant way before she'd expected it. God seems to have been acting both very slowly, a bit like a sloth, and very quickly, like a very keen rabbit, in these women's lives. And yet here their stories coalesce. And Mary in an overflowing expression of joy to her cousin sings one of the most famous songs in all of history said and sung throughout the Catholic and Anglican church and other churches every week, sometimes more than once a week. Mary's been promised this child who will bring salvation and light and hope to the world. And in this prophetic song expresses the present, the past and the future all at once. She's rooted in the present as she celebrates with her cousin in her cousin's home, God's actions in her own simple earthly life. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices. He's looked with favour on the lowliness of his servant. Mary remembers too God's acts of justice in the past. He has shown strength. He has scattered the proud. He has brought down the powerful. He has filled the hungry. He has helped his servant Israel. And Mary looks to the future, to what God will do for the times ahead. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And this song of holy justice celebrates the messages of Micah and the other prophets and prefigures the report of the healings and salvations Jesus sent to the imprisoned John the Baptist. Let me just show you one more. There we go. According to one tradition of the of Advent, the Advent wreath, the four candles which are lit, one for each Sunday of Advent, representing firstly the patriarchs in whom God promised a great nation, second the prophets through whom God spoke, the third candle is John the Baptist who pointed to Jesus in his lifetime, and the fourth candle, today's candle, and the final candle is Mary, the mother of Jesus. This tradition allows us to remember the staggering arc of history which has led to Jesus's birth. By lighting one candle a week, the wreath encircling the central candle which follows the trajectory through history grows gradually brighter until on Christmas day, the central candle representing Christ is lit as the climactic event in history is finally here. I love the season of Advent because it helps us to remember, to recall God's faithful commitments in the past and to look ahead like Mary did to how God will continue to act within time from generation to generation and ultimately in Christ's return to earth. 
It demonstrates God's timelessness, reaching both backwards and forwards through history, and yet speaking personally into people's lives in the present. Advent is a time of waiting expectantly in the moment, pondering the timing of a God who is sometimes very slow and sometimes very quick and always faithful to his word. This waiting may be difficult and costly, yet we can have faith because of God's actions in the past. We can have hope for the future. And in this present moment, we can choose to receive God's abiding and everlasting love. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Emma, would you like us to like to lead us in a final worship song? Thank you.
can't stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great to worship together. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Tessa. Um, sadly, this is our last gathering uh, before Christmas. Um, and our services will start again on Sunday the 9th online. Um, we will also then have our Tuesdays from the following week are going to go back um, into the church every week. We'll then have a, the church will be open Mondays with the watchers. Uh, Tuesday lunchtime, um, we'll have a service uh, in person. Uh, Wednesday will be in person. And for the first quarter, we will continue with our Sundays online other than the last Sunday of the month where we will be in person. So for, and, and for those who uh, are able to join us in person, that will be wonderful too, as it would be great to get back to gathering all the time in person as much as possible. Subject of course, to uh, the continued state of pandemic. And we pray that things will ease a little bit which, yeah, the community, we continue to pray. Um, just wanted to mention just uh, briefly, I think everyone's aware of our Christmas tree, our hygiene product Christmas tree. And that's been wonderful actually, in that it's raised uh, the profile of the work that we do with the hygiene bank. And as I've always said, this can only happen um, if we as a community are praying for each other in that we we take on different tasks, but it is us as a community that enables it. And I think you know that there are 16, I think it's 16 uh, community partners and all of our community partners got deliveries uh, of hygiene products. The schools got some, the hostels got some, um, the Weaver's Adventure, uh, club got some uh, earlier this week and so because of our activity as a community there were many people who've received the gift of clean uh, and kingdom moments uh, through that and there are a number of other communities I think Tessa I think you might did did those hundred bags of, of hygiene products arrive yesterday or set on Friday yeah, uh, this was a corporate. And, and again, this is part of what our role is encouraging uh, a serving attitude. One of the local corporates, they had a whole team of people packing 100 hygiene bags of hygiene products that we will give out in the new year. So there are many, many positives to, uh, to the things that we all do together, which is wonderful. I do hope and pray that we will all have a blessed Christmas. And so the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and with all those you love, always. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.